Graduated, elevated. Now it's my time to shine, yeah, let's go. Graduated, elevated. Now it's my time to shine, yeah, let's go. Major moves, power moves. One thing that I uh, sort of missed out, uh, Norma, in the research proposal, mm -hmm. but um, we can add on here, is that positionality, especially if someone is looking at uh, uh, qualitative research design, you need to ensure that um, you are very clear on your position um, as a researcher. So what positionality here means is uh, I'm trying to explain how you are either in the uh, in, in alignment with the participants or you are keeping a distance from the participants because as researchers we cannot sort of say that we don't coexist we coexist with the participants some way or the other yeah but it's so important to uh, clear this out why you are not going to influence them you know the, these are the things that you sort of already need to start thinking about and it can come up in the interview as well or if it doesn't come in the interview it it might come on later onwards with the defense that how, how would you position yourself yes no um thank you very much and i think the other thing is um just to to throw in another question in regards to you know when you're in the interview for example do you think it's necessary to try and find out as much as you can when they ask you do you have any questions in regards to the relationship expectations if you were to be successful in your opinion or do you think actually that's taking it a bit too far what are your thoughts on that um i would say um discuss about the expectation definitely discuss about the expectation expectation in the sense that um, what sort of deadlines are we looking at um, do you want to, um, if i'm successful how often should we meet or you know these are the things that if you have it in line from the beginning it sort of helps you understand how serious the business is or how uh, relaxed the business is going to look like in the next uh, three years or whatever time your candidate chair is for so um, expectations in different aspects as well what is expected in terms of um, the small uh, not not i won't say minor uh, milestones because all my milestones are really huge uh, in anything that you come across you know uh, even if even if it involves getting your first draft proposal out that's a milestone you know, you, you might not have thought you have done it, but you have done it. So expectations in that sense, talk about word limit. What word are you targeting? How much are you expected to write at what point in time? And uh, how often you are supposed to be submitting the drafts or how soon do the supervisors require drafts from you as well? You can talk about uh, those things as well. And um, in the interview, expectations can also come in the form of publication and conferences as well. Yes. Are they expecting you to publish as you go on or are they expecting you to attend conferences? Because most supervisors do. Um, most supervisors do like the idea that um, you are going to publish or you are going to be presenting at conferences, but e even without uh, formal uh, data. You can still present because last year we attended so many conferences uh, where our colleagues were presenting they didn't have uh, the data yet but they were still presenting and they were still trying to iron out the problems uh, that they were encountering and a lot of people had so many interesting questions to ask them so one of the things that you can do is definitely ask um, at least the number of publications you can expect or the number of conferences some universities i know in asia as well sometimes they have a specific number a colleague is doing a phd in um, in uh, asia and uh, i think he, they have uh, three publications they need to have uh, out and a number of conference uh, presentations as well so different universities so that's why i'm saying like when you have that interview it's better to clear it out and not enroll in the program and then you're like oh i have to do two publications on top of phd how does that work <laughs> exactly. <laughs> 
No, no. Um, thank you very much. That was very honest again in terms of opinion. And I think it is the way forward to ask that, you know, in terms of expectations, then you're not really shocked um, yes. when that information is being relayed to you. You're already um, swimming on the same level playing is it playing on the same level playing field I yeah, think that's the same. Level, um, yeah yeah there <laughs> but in terms of the next question then how do I write um as a postgraduate student in terms of a PhD student I think th this question came as um, a long monologue in the sense of they felt like the writing was not at the level where it should be and right. in terms of understanding um you know in terms of how to write as a PhD student they felt under pressure and just the thought of writing as a you know postgraduate it just gave them anxiety and I've tried to condense the question um to make it fit for purpose basically this person is struggling at this moment in time so what advice do you have for them Right, right. Um, I think that's um, something that I believe almost all uh, PhD students go through because um, if you're doing an MPhil, if you're doing a higher degree research, uh, sometimes what I, I, I feel in uh, my own experience and the experience of colleagues I've noticed is that they feel that if you are going from master's to PhD, there might not be a huge gap to look at, but actually there is a major jump from a master's to a PhD in terms of writing, in terms of research work that goes into in terms of presentation of data, um, in terms of uh, presentation of your own writing. Some of the things that uh, I, I would uh, definitely advise is that how much reading have you done before you started writing? Have you read up on uh, a different thesis that you have come across or you have just thought today I'm going to write and then you're sitting there and then you just start putting in text referencing here and just trying to write out something like that. Because you have to remember your first draft is going to be the most crappy thing that you're going to ever write, which is fine. It is completely fine. You are not supposed to be writing at a very high level when you are doing your first draft. So don't put too much pressure on yourself that my first draft needs to be perfect. Even when we were doing the final proposal, I remember my primary supervisor saying, uh, Prash, it doesn't have to be perfect. It's a proposal. It doesn't have to be perfect. So right now when you're looking at, see how much you have read on academic work. Either it's the books in your field, either it's the journal papers in your field. How much have you read? When I'm saying reading, I'm actually asking you to look at the writing style that they have used. How are they introducing an argument? So that, because a whole thesis is an argument, right? You are basically trying to argue why your idea is uh, um, important. So look at how they have put the arguments through and how is that particular argument um, sort of flowing paragraph to paragraph or subheadings to subheadings? How is it flowing? Study that. Don't worry about the content so much. But just look at how it is flowing. It will give you an idea of how to uh, position your own writing, how to make your own writing in that aspect. And another important point, I think, no matter what, uh, probably the student is um, unable to recognize is that sometimes we put so much pressure on ourselves thinking that today I'm going to write a literature review and then goes off the whole bus. You know, you are thinking that from eight o'clock till 10 o'clock, you are just sitting and thinking I'm writing a literature review. By the time it comes to 12 o'clock and then you're like, ah, oh, it's a lunchtime. I'll do this after lunch. You come back after lunch, right? <laughs> and then you write on a blank mm -hmm. uh, Microsoft document, you write on literature review, but there's nothing going beyond the literature review. So how do we tackle this? This is one of the things that I would say. Don't tell yourself you're writing a literature review. Just tell yourself that you're going to write an introduction to the literature review. So you are today going to write just 10 lines, five lines, one paragraph, or uh, just 200 words. You just tell yourself, I'm just going to write 200 words today. That's it. And I'm not worried about the rest of the day. And you will notice once you have written those uh, 200 words, or once you have written whatever 
the set uh, target of that particular day is, you will notice that next morning you will get excited to say, okay, I'm going to add another subtopic to this literature review section. Mm -hmm. But if you tell yourself from day one, I'm writing the literature review, it's going to add so much pressure to you. Mm -hmm. You're just going to freeze when you're looking at the screen. But how it it is personally helped me is not only with the thesis, but when I'm writing journal papers and all, I quickly come up with sub subheadings, and then I put where whatever I need to put wherever before I tidy up the document. I, the tidying up the document is the last thing you do. So when you are writing up something, just ensure in your mind, be relaxed, take it. You know, okay, I'm going to write five lines. Let's see after the five lines how I feel. Then keep on going, keep on going. You'll automatically then be, make it into a routine. You you will, as you develop in the next three years, you will make it into a routine. So I can totally understand it's, it's difficult to, um, you know, come up with a master's background or come up from your undergraduate or come up from a break of a couple of years and then going to uh, PhD and writing and all of this can be overwhelming, definitely. But there are a lot of resources you can use. There are lots and lots of resources that you can go through. Um, try and get on Twitter because on Twitter you will find so many people who have um, gone through the same thing and they can suggest some resources you can look into as well. And get hold of your university website. I mean, I cannot overemphasize this. Sometimes the university websites link you to their library, which will then have uh, academic skills sort of uh, links where you can go about and see how you write a, um, a research uh, problem or how you write uh, the research questions, how you write an introductory um, chapter. Those things will be there. Study that, look at the style, make it your own. I love that. So in summary, what you're saying is somebody as an individual, not to say this person, you have to be a detective. Yes. You have to look for the knowledge yourself. And when you find it, you have to teach yourself. And what you don't understand, then you go back to your supervisors or you use the resources that are already online or any webinars that you can find on YouTube and also the Twitter and resources that are already yes. there because people have created, I think there are groups now in terms of different things on there. So right. amazing, love it. In terms of the next question. Yes, yes. Which is, um, I keep attending um, interviews and I've sent in my proposal, but no one ever gets back to me and says, I haven't got the place or I've got the place. I don't get any feedback in regards to how I've articulated myself in regards to what I want to research. But when I do start the process, I do get that, you know, interaction with the potential supervisor. But at the end, zero. So what advice do you have for, for this person? Um, I, I, I feel it's not only one person who goes through this. I mean, when I started uh, looking at universities, I, uh, I approached probably at least 49, I think on top of my head, I can remember when I was, uh, this was back in 2019 when I was trying to approach them. From there, I, I would say people who responded, uh, the response rate was very low. I, I, can, I, I think maybe only four or five from the 49 or so that um, were there. Some had positive things to say, some had uh, no supervisors available or things like this. But what the person's question is that um, he or she has actually gone through the interview process and uh, was very hopeful and things have not come back um, in, in terms of feedback. I would say, why don't you write back to the people? Whoever was there, first step is to write back to those people whether it was the HDR coordinator, whether it was the supervisor or a particular team that was actually looking at uh, your work, whoever it may be, and say that, um, I mean, don't write to them immediately, probably give them three weeks or a month. Yeah, just so that downtime. <laughs> cool time, time. Exactly, exactly. Write to them and say, I'm just following up on the interview. I didn't hear anything back. Um, if if there is any feedback available, please could you let me know or I'm available for another interview if 
the need is there, you know, so something like that you can do that. That's one way of looking at it. The other one is if you are not getting feedback and you have noticed that you haven't got feedback for, uh, let's say, approximately three months, don't hang on to that. Just keep the motivation level going and, yeah. you know, just, just think that that opportunity is somewhere else. Just think in that terms mm -hmm. and then move on to the next. Because uh, when I was because I have had a similar experience, you know, uh, with these 49 universities that I approached. Uh, my colleagues keep telling me as well, they approached 60 universities or more. But what kept all of us going is that there are thousands of universities in the world. One of it might just fit in with what we are thinking about. So you should just think of the bigger picture and not get... Uh, uh, demotivated or you know not get dampened by uh, not receiving response from uh, at least 10, 10 or 20 universities that you have been speaking to D doesn't matter just keep on going because the second you lose your motivation the second you lose your motivation you will completely drop the idea and you will then think about some other things uh, your mental health will be affected you know don't do that you you got a very bad response. Somebody said, uh, I'm sorry, your interview was not successful, blah, blah, blah. Just go and watch a movie at the cinema. Just hang out with your friends. Vent about it with somebody you are very comfortable with. Refresh yourself. Come next day after good sleep and start again. Apply again. Yeah. I mean, yeah, keep it going. I, yeah, I, I, lo I love that. And... And the other thing I think that we will both touch on is the fact that it's not as easy as us saying, you know, yes. go and be with your friends. But you have to tell yourself that now I'm looking after me. I can't control how that person has reacted. I can't control yes. what they've said. And sometimes you really want to go to a university and it's not the one for you. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's a different you know, maybe a smaller university, essentially. So, no, I thank you very much for, for sharing that. I guess the next question is, um, <laughs> when I finish my PhD, am I going to earn a lot of money? <laughs> or am I going to be um, struggling to pay my bills as I'm currently struggling now? Help. <laughs> so that's how <laughs> that came in. <laughs> um, yeah, what's your take on that? <laughs> uh, I think you deliberately left this for me. I have a strong <laughs> feeling <laughs> that Norma, you decided to just, uh, you know, uh, what do you call this? Push the envelope to my side. I mean, push the bucket to my side or something, you know. I but do. Um, <laughs> sharing is caring. <laughs> <laughs> it um, it it depends. I would say it depends. Um, a PhD is a qualification. Uh, which will definitely open opportunities for you and if you do it right of course it will definitely open uh, opportunities for you but it is not the final destination so you need to think of how to get your phd out there one of the uh, ways that a lot of people look at it is from the publication point of view from conferences point of view or from uh, sharing it to policymakers, or uh, ensuring it reaches out to a wider audience than just the academic audience. That's one way of looking at it. In terms of where the money factor comes in is with this. If you have got really good publications, if you have proved your CV uh, that, you know, this is just my PhD, but look at my CV. From the PhD, I was able to do, or during the candidature, I was able to do all these fancy things. I was able to attend, you know, prestigious conferences. Um, I was able, I was invited at a guest at this particular place, whichever, you know, all of these things, then you will be marketable. And then obviously you can apply either for postdoc, you can apply for research positions that come up with different universities and different countries have their different salary scale that you can look at. And what it means in a lot of money is I'm not sure where the person is right now. Yeah. So. I'm not sure about the person's minimum wage rate, because if you compare that to different countries, they have different. For example, in Australia, uh, postdoc uh, would start at a minimum of 80,000 uh, uh, AUD per year, and it can go up to 
and again, it depends where you are. Uh, it can go up to even 100,000 100, per year for postdoc opportunities. And then um, depending on, on a lot of factors, you can get this. And uh, another thing is that some uh, governments also give grants to people with PhDs to work on other projects. So then again, you can um, look at this particular opportunity as well and uh, see how you can get the funding and what you need and all of those things. So <laughs> another uh, thing that just sort of I want to bring into this question is that if you are there for the money, I think you will get really frustrated. So, you know, please don't think that the only reason you are going to do a PhD is because you want to get money. Oh, gosh, mm -hmm. I, I don't know um, how that's going to turn out to you, for you in a long term. But I have friends who are now working in the private sector with a PhD because it allows you to just go into that because there are agencies that are looking for people who are specialized in a particular field. Uh, the private sector is looking for people who specialize in a particular field so that they can be the policy advisors, so that they can be people who know the technical aspect of things and they can be used there as well. So PhD is not just about academia. You don't just have to be in academia. And um, um, if you do look at these private entities that um, have jobs for PhDs, they do also have a good salary range. That's what I can say. But my bottom take on this is if you want to remain in academia, um, stop being too bothered about the money aspect. You might just be frustrated. If you are there for the passion of doing research, like I, I love to be in research, like I, I like to explore what is new in the field, um, like, you know, this uh, chat um, GPT, which has come out and linguistics has got a lot of things there as well. Linguists have got a lot of things. We just had two weeks ago a presenter who is the director of research at a particular institute to talk about that. So we are more interested in those aspects. The money is just an additional thing that sort of comes about. but. If your priority is money mm -hmm. and everything else in research comes later, I think you might end up being a bit frustrated. So, yeah, I, mean, I mean, that's just my take on that. I think you've put it really kindly. I love that you might be frustrated. I will borrow that. Um, but yeah, no, I think the the thing with research it requires passion and a bit of love i think that's what drives research and i yes. think in terms of money it's just an added value you know it, just the way you've put it i think is is quite clear in terms of the next question then is um is a phd actually worth it in regards to completing it and getting the title or should I just give up now? Because I think this person's really frustrated and they're not sure, again, which links into some of the stuff that you've said in terms of okay. self-motivation and knowing why you're doing what you're doing. And, you know, what is your take on that? This, I think, is a question that we usually sort of um, ask ourselves somewhere when we have already started the program. So it's it's not a question that people ask at the beginning mm -hmm. that, oh, should I, is it worth it? They will get into this and then they will. So I'll, I'll share my experience on this. Yeah. In 2015, I got into a PhD program. Um, I, I believe it was a very tough interview. I went through the interview process and there were two uh, professors who interviewed me and we started on and uh, mind you i must have been just uh 23 going on 24 or something like that i don't know why i was doing that to myself at that age but <laughs> so when i went through it norma um yeah. the year that went on um it was very frustrating for me i i couldn't take the feedback properly. I didn't know how to take the feedback properly. And then I said, I think it's not worth it. So I quit the program. I just left the program. I said, I, I can't put myself. I'm 24, going on 25, blah, blah, blah. I said, this is not for me. I'm just going to leave it. So I left it. I got back to it four years later. Um, 
when I thought that now I'm ready for this because I had been doing a lot of uh, publications uh, while I was not doing a PhD. I knew that I had built the skills in the sense that reviewers of journal papers were given feedback uh, as they as supervisors do as well. And they were very harsh or they were very good or whichever way. And then it got back to me and said, now I, that I can take feedback from uh, the supervisors. And that's one of the major reasons why people are frustrated is that if you can handle feedback, I think handling feedback is uh, number one thing that uh, number one skill that you need to have in a PhD program mm -hmm. because people get frustrated is that um, I think my supervisor is being very harsh on me. I thought I did very nicely this time, but mm -hmm. the rewriting part, why should I rewrite? People ask these questions a lot. I mean, colleagues around, they always have this kind of question, but if I had, you know, just sort of continued with the PhD back in 2015, being so frustrated and just continue. I think it would have been a really uh, time consuming process. It had been uh, frustrating is just an understatement, I would say. It would have uh, led to a very low quality PhD, definitely 100%. In 2019, when I started approaching universities for this, the dynamics was different. When I sent the proposal out uh, to the current university, they told me that I needed to change a few things, but I was more than happy to do it because I knew that now I know the dynamics of it when I got into it. And uh, honestly, uh, Noma, from the time that we have been going through feedback and all of those things, I remember last year coming back uh, after the break and I told my supervisor, I said, uh, I would like to submit next year and this is the uh, thing that I'm going to do. So I said, what do you think? And my supervisor said to me, I said, Prash, you can do it because you have been addressing the feedback uh, properly. Mm -hmm. So I, I go back to the student. I would say, if you want to quit because uh, this is your first time doing a PhD and you think um, you can't, can you think of taking a break for one, uh, one research period or two research periods? Is it possible with your current uh, candidature? If you can take a break, go for it. Don't leave the entire program if you think uh, you just need some time to refresh yourself and come back. Once you come back from the break, how do you feel? Are, are you now at the right state and refreshed and all of that? Because that break also means going through reading some um, biographies or reading um, past PhD students' experience and frustrations that they have faced with writing or with the whole process, trying to look at their lived experience and trying to compare or sort of try and uh, relate it to your own and say that, yeah, probably I can, uh, I can uh, see that I'm not the only person with this. Everybody goes to frustration. I'm sure, Norma, you would agree with this. Everybody goes to frustration at some point in time. It's, it doesn't matter how old you are. It, it doesn't matter how uh, long you have been in the program. You go through that frustration. But as individuals, it just depends how we are able to tackle those things, how we are able to handle uh, those feedbacks. That's what counts the most, you know. So again, going back, please don't quit the program. If you think there's scope for you to take a break, uh, go and take a break, uh, even if it's for one semester, one year. I mean, in my case, I took a break for four years. I, I just, um, but I didn't waste my four years. I will not say I was, because I was trying to read up. I was trying to um, do some research on my own. I was trying to publish journal articles on my own. So the four year break that I took was very refreshing when I got back into the program and uh, now that I've submitted the thesis, I, I feel that it the frustrations were worth it. I, I just feel that it, it was worth it. So. Mm 